head. Oh. <laughs> so uh, welcome everyone to week 13 of Romans and Galatians on Wednesday night here in person in League City at New Beginnings uh, and then online. And uh, again, I failed to start the recording before our prayer. Francis uh, led us in a in a, a good prayer and i'm sorry for those of you online that i uh, won't get to share in that uh, but know that you were prayed for and uh, pray you're blessed by the study as you do it later um, so we're going to be carrying on tonight uh, we finished up romans last week and in these final three sessions we will uh, cover the book of galatians let me check here one more, Jackie. Okay, don't want to leave anyone out. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll be doing just a brief intro to Galatians, not spending a lot of time on the intro, and then uh, going on into chapters one and two. And uh, your notes will say this, but Galatians uh, has much of its uh, content and theme in common with Romans, the theme, uh, but in a sense different from Romans. It, it's, he is talking about salvation through faith, but uh, you know, differentiated from Romans, he really Paul really focuses on uh, the danger of the Judaizing teachers in Galatia. And we'll see a bit about that here. I want to do the video. Uh, so from Bible Project, because it's helpful, at least up through chapter two, we won't do chapters three and four. So let me get this set uh, to do better with the video. And you can find it online, but I have it downloaded, so we'll just go with it from here. Paul's letter to the Galatians. It was written to a number of churches in the region of Galatia, where Paul had traveled on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the stories in the book of Acts. He wrote this important letter from a place of deep passion and frustration. Here's the backstory. Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement in Jerusalem, but its message was for all humanity, and so it quickly spread beyond Israel. By Paul's time as a missionary, there were as many non-Jews as there were Jewish people in the Jesus movement, and this sparked a huge debate that we know about from the book of Acts chapter 15. Historically, the covenant people of God were focused in one ethnic group, Israel, and they were set apart by the practices commanded in the Torah, like circumcision of males, eating kosher, observing the Sabbath. And there were many Jewish Christians who believed that for all of these non-Jews to truly become a part of God's family, they needed to obey the laws of the Torah. And so some of these Jewish Christians ended up coming to the Galatian churches. They were undermining Paul and demanding circumcision of all these male non-Jewish Christians. And so many of them were. And when Paul found out, he was brokenhearted and angry. And this letter is the result. He first challenges the Galatians with his summary of the gospel message about the crucified Messiah. He then argues that this gospel is what creates the new multi-ethnic family of Jesus and Abraham. And then he shows how this gospel is what truly transforms people by the presence and power of the Spirit. He opens by expressing his bewilderment that the Galatians have embraced a different gospel. It's the one promoted by these Christians who badmouth Paul and demand circumcision. So Paul first defends the authenticity of his message and authority as an apostle. He was commissioned by the risen Jesus himself to go to the non-Jewish world. Remember the story from the book of Acts. Paul says it was only later that he went to Jerusalem to consult the other apostles like Peter or James. And when he told them he wasn't requiring non-Jewish Christians to be circumcised or eat kosher, they were in full support. But this tension ran deeper. Peter had come to Antioch to visit and see all of these non-Jewish Christians, and he was eating and mingling with them. But when some of this Jerusalem opposition group showed up in Antioch, Peter caved under their pressure. He stopped eating with these uncircumcised Christians, and he was avoiding them. 
And so Paul confronted and accused Peter of hypocrisy, of not staying true to the gospel. For Paul, demanding these new Christians to become circumcised and Torah observant, it's wrong-headed for all kinds of reasons. First of all, because it's a betrayal of the gospel. Or in his words, people are not justified by the works of the Torah, but rather by the faith of Jesus the Messiah. And we have faith in the Messiah Jesus. To be justified, or literally to be declared righteous, it's a rich Old Testament term for Paul. It's when God declares that someone is in a right relationship with him. They're forgiven, they're given a place in God's family, and they are being transformed by God's grace. And it's Paul's conviction that no one can be justified by observing the commands of the Torah, but only by the faith of Jesus. This is a dense phrase, and it could refer to Jesus' own faithfulness in living and dying on our behalf, or it could refer to our own trust and devotion to Jesus. Either way, the point is clear. People are justified only through trusting in what God did for them through Jesus, not by what they do for themselves. At the heart of Paul's gospel is this claim that when people trust in the Messiah Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of them. His life, death, and resurrection become theirs. Or in his words, I've been crucified with the Messiah, and it's not I who come back to life, it's the Messiah living in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the reason anyone can say that they are right with God or belong to Jesus' covenant family, it's not because they obeyed the laws of the Torah. It's only because of what Jesus did for them that they could never do for themselves. Now, this profound understanding of what Jesus accomplished, it has huge implications for who can now be included in God's covenant family and for what it means to live as a member of that family. And we will stop there. This will carry on later next week and the following uh, with those chapters. But so it is noteworthy. I want to look at um, go on this from the part about the Judaizers or really you get it uh, even better over here, the Judaizers. Um, and how they were disrupting the work. There is a good resource that I've used a lot. Um, it's this book here, The Untold Story of the New Testament Church. Uh, I mentioned it in other classes, but it's by Frank Viola. Uh, I would go to the cover again, but I want to uh, read a, a little bit here from this, from this book. And um, Frank just does a very good job of telling the story chronologically of the New Testament churches. And so the gospel, the way it impacted the churches in Galatia, he says here, the churches of Galatia are classless societies where social distinctions are erased, Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, rich and poor, no longer exist. And that wasn't true in Roman society, of course. The believers see themselves as part of the same family, part of a new race, part of a new colony from the heavenly realm. They eat together, work together, greet each other with the holy kids, raise their children together, take care of one another and bury one another. It's this joy and love that the Galatian Christians have for one another that will shake Roman Empire to its very foundations. Now, that's what they had with the gospel. But here come these teachers from Jerusalem who are saying, no, you can't be a, a true believer. You can't be fully accepted by God uh, if, unless you are circumcised and uh, observe the law of Moses. And... Um, so this is Frank's, uh, uh, and, it, and it very well could be, this is Frank Viola's understanding, and there's other teachers that I know that have taught this. Uh, just the highlighted section here again. Oh, let me, so that I can see. Sorry, get back to this part at least, and I can see some of you there. And Chooks, I needed to see who else had joined. The Judaizers are headed up by one unnamed man. Paul will later refer to this man as his thorn in the flesh. On three separate occasions, Paul will ask God to remove this thorn from his life. The Lord will respond by saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is, the Lord chooses not to remove the thorn from Paul's life, but he will deliver Paul through all the suffering that it will bring him. The thorn, this unnamed Judaizer who will seek to destroy Paul's work, is given to Paul to keep him humble 
amid the glorious revelation of Christ that he has received. Now, uh, you know, there's no reason. We don't have to take issue with that. Maybe we've always thought the thorn in the flesh was his eyesight problem or something else. And it very well could be. It's not a salvation issue. So we don't have to, uh, you know, uh, take sides over it. But even if this, uh, these Judaizers and this one in particular is not the thorn in the flesh that Paul was referring to, it doesn't change the fact that he had this very difficult person and, and people beyond just the one to deal with in his life, just like us. Uh, we can say again, people, EGR people, extra grace required people, and we all we all have them in our lives. And if we're true, you know, brutally honest, we may be that EGR person ourselves sometime. They require people require uh, grace in dealing with us. Um, here, this really is kind of helpful. And I'm going to go ahead and cover this bit because Paul has to deal with, he has to defend his apostleship more than just to the Galatians. He does it in second Corinthians to the Corinthian church. So it's, it's good for us to know some of the reasons that the uh, Jewish teachers from Jerusalem uh, rallied against Paul. Uh, so when the Judaizers, I'm just starting right there, when the Judaizers arrived in South Galatia, they introduced themselves as brothers from the Jerusalem church. They tell the new converts in Galatia the following, Jerusalem is the center of God's work on earth. The 12 apostles are the only authority for what the true gospel is, and they were commissioned by Christ himself. Paul did not come from Jerusalem, and he was not commissioned by Christ. Paul visited Jerusalem shortly after his conversion and spent some time with the apostles there. The apostles instructed him in the basic principles of the gospel and authorized him to preach the gospel he had learned from them. But when he left Jerusalem and returned to Cilicia, Paul modified his gospel to make it more acceptable to the Gentiles. These are the accusations. Paul's gospel is deficient. The Jerusalem leaders believe in the God-given practice of circumcision and observing the law and the traditions. These are the hard parts of the gospel because Paul is a man pleaser. He's preaching a gospel that omits these parts. This law-free gospel that he proclaims is not supported by the apostles of the Jews or the Jerusalem church. Believing in Jesus coupled with obeying the law of Moses justifies and sanctifies a man before God. Peter's the chief apostle among the 12. Paul had the arrogance to rebuke the apostle Peter to his face. This proves that Paul is a freelancer who's engaging in independent work apart from the ministry of the 12. Paul is inconsistent in his views. While he does not preach circumcision to the Gentiles, he preaches it to the Jews. Paul is a tremor. He adapts his gospel to his environment. Well, you can understand. And then it was that and more, all of these uh, accusations against Paul. And of course, he not only had to be concerned about the, Jer the Galatian believers, but the personal affront hurt that he felt uh, as any of us can relate to. So he writes Galatians and Galatians is probably the first letter of the New Testament written uh, about 49 AD. So let's say if it's about 50, that's roughly 20 years, 17 to 20 years after Jesus is crucified and resurrected. So that many years passed before any, any letter was written. And we're pretty sure that Galatians uh, was the first. Uh, just the highlighted, no, a little bit more uh, propagation, the reason for writing Galatians. This is the first piece of Christian literature ever penned. The letter is a monumental statement against legalism. Paul answers every argument that the Juda Judaizers used to persuade the Galatians to follow the law of Moses. Galatians is the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. Justification and sanctification are by grace through faith and not by works of the law. In this letter, Paul will connect with the Phrygian slaves who populate the Galatian churches. He will use the word slave or its derivative a total of 16 times. Many of his metaphors contrast with freedom. He talks about bondage, confinement, custodianship, minor child, and slavery. Further, Paul will read, Mind the Galatians that they are free from all law and holy in Christ without blemish in his sight. 
In Paul's zeal to preserve the law free gospel of Jesus Christ, he writes this letter using bitter metaphors and scathing indictments against the Judaizers. Example, Paul describes circumcision as being severed from Christ and adds his wish that those who insist on circumcision would mutilate themselves and literally meaning that they would castrate themselves, that they would not just circumcise, but that they would castrate themselves. It's evident that Paul is angry when writing the letter for he omits the Thanksgiving prayer that marks all of his other letters. Paul is confident that the Galatians will receive the letter and adopt no other view. Well, that uh, to me, that helps in uh, kind of setting the tone for, uh, for Galatians because it is different. We'll, we'll listen to chapters one and two and you're going to see he does a greeting, but then no prayer, no commendation about the faith of the people there like he does in Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, and all the others. He, he's so troubled by what he's hearing that he gets uh, right to the task of, of reprimanding and exhorting the Galatians. Uh, any, any initial response just based on, on that much that we've covered before we go on and start listening. Just thank you for sharing that resource because that helps, uh, that helps me understand as well, uh, kind of why the letter has a different tone to it. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Rebecca, that that is helpful. And I meant to bring the book itself, the uh, just showing uh, the title here on my Kindle version, but the untold story of the New Testament church, Frank Biola. He's a good Bible teacher. Uh, he co-authored a book with Philip Yancey and, and then another one that's a very good one that I've mentioned in the gospels class, God's favorite place on earth. And he writes, and it's about Bethany because that's where Jesus stayed he didn't really ever stay overnight as far as we know in jerusalem he would always go to bethany like mary and martha and lazarus's home and it, it's kind of a it's not a fictional novel it's rooted in all of scripture but I, in in a sense yes you would have to say it's a it's a historical fiction uh because he turn he just blends it all into a story but i think it's well grounded in scripture and so you'll find that one to be a really good read. This one here uh, just goes through chronologically uh, all of the, from the gospels to revelation and tells, tells what was happening, takes bits of the book of Acts and tells the background of what's happening with each book that's written. So let's go ahead and uh, listen to, start with chapter one. Galatians chapter one. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, 
who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. And I'm going to pause, pause there. Uh, I'm sorry for this uh, detour, but uh, I already forgot it at the beginning. It's just like I forgot to hit the recording at the very beginning. So I had wanted to just let you know every year, for those of you that haven't been with SHBI before, we have just a closing celebration uh, like a week after the semester is over. For, so uh, it's the 75th year of SHBI and there's been one at the end of every year, except the only one we didn't was uh, COVID year 2020. We went ahead and came together last year, but it's auspicious day, Friday, May 13th, Friday the 13th day, but it's okay. We're gonna do it anyway at 7 p.m. here in League City at, at the building. Just worship and hearing from some of the students hearing more about, you know, vision for the future of SHBI fellowship. And then the only fundraiser that we really do in the year that, in, that we let students and everyone know about is just one during May and different ways to give. I'll get this out. I'll send it out as an attachment with um, like the next week. So you'll have it, but I just wanted to uh, put it before you to get it on your radar screen. And I'll also send an email to all of the students. Uh, so, now back over to, uh, you know, to our, our text here. So as you, as we listen through that and just go back through, uh, but well, let me pause. I often like to say after hearing the text read, uh, is there any just initial response to it? Anything uh, that uh, comes to mind that you want to, to respond to initially? Let's go ahead and you're still free to, uh, you know, let me know anytime that you have something to share. Uh, he identifies himself like he often does at the beginning of a letter, Paul an apostle, but immediately there's kind of a defense in there, uh, not sent by men, uh, from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ. And so you can see, uh, woven throughout his letter, a response to all of these accusations from the Judaizers, uh, legalist. And it can sound far removed and irrelevant to us, but we need to know it's not. The principle at stake here is Paul guarding the gospel of Jesus from legalism. And legalism never rests. The enemy will always, throughout church history, for the 2,000 years of the church, the enemy uh, leverages legalism any time, every time that he can, because it compromises the gospel and it puts it back in our domain that no, no, yeah, we, we can acknowledge theoretically we're saved by grace through faith, but the reality is it's up to me and the way that I live. And, and legalism creeps in in other forms, even if it's not about our salvation, as I said, uh, as humans, there's no limitation to what we can be legalistic about. We can be legalistic, and we have been legalistic about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit only works in this way. You've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit this way. You have to speak in tongues, or you should not. Uh, there's, there's any number of things that, that we can be legalistic about, how to observe the Lord's Supper, exactly how to do a baptism, uh, exactly how to uh, conduct a worship service. So it's always an issue with us. So we need to understand how relevant Galatians is. Um, goes on to churches in Galatia. So those established uh, on his uh, first missionary journey, uh, the normal greeting in verse three, grace and peace. 
gets both Jews and Gentiles grace, uh, Gentile greeting, charis, uh, peace, shalom, a gen, you know, normal Hebrew greeting. Um, I can't hear. Cannot hear. What about, is that, is that the I same? can hear it now. I can hear okay. you fine. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, just please, please do let me know. I'll hold it up here uh, a little closer to make sure. Um, but verse four, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, um, according to the will of God, the father, uh, and then verse six, he, he just dives right into it again. Uh, none of the normal things that he would say, commending them for their faith, uh, rather, and he uses uh, bold and striking language. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ, turning to a different gospel. And in verse seven, which is really no gospel at all, because we know gospel means what? good news and there is no good news to the fact that well it's not just jesus that saves you it also depends on your observance of the law of moses circumcision and keeping there's no good news in it being uh, a matter of our works uh, so he says yeah you could you could say a different gospel but it's really not a gospel it is it's not good news and he says that some people are throwing you into confusion, uh, trying to disrupt this gospel. Uh, and then verse eight, but even if I or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach, let him be eternally condemned. And so that's really strong language there. And then he just repeats it in verse nine. As I said, uh, let him, you know, let that person be eternally condemned. And it's, it's damned, you know, it is just a strong word. Let them be, let that person be damned uh, for preaching this other gospel. Uh, and, it, you know, in, in referring to a person, so it could be this head Judaizer, this one who's leading the whole group of them. And uh, just, uh, yeah, figuratively, uh, a thorn in Paul's side. Uh, so we need to hear that. Uh, what is it? It's uh, it's in your notes, but there's the there's the thought. Um, uh, just let me go on. There, we're looking at his defense of his authority. Uh, through chapter two, uh, go on through the life. Uh, this was the, just the, out of your notes that I was uh, looking for. Uh, one of the one mark of cults is a modern saving revelation added to the gospel, so that you know we can think of some that have added revelation since Jesus sometimes by an angel, uh, others, you know, uh, through a man. And so that, you know, Paul is saying, doesn't matter, man, angel, if it is a, an angelic being, a spiritual being, if it's other than uh, faith in Jesus Christ, uh, it is a false gospel. And today, in our context, we had to continue to be alert to perversions of the gospel. Uh, and again, there's, there's variations out there that can affect all of us. And we, we need to be aware of, uh, of those that uh, teach, even if it is, you know, something that may not sound like a perversion, but no, you know, if we have enough faith, we really shouldn't have to suffer or, or we should be victorious over everything, but that's not the message that we get consistently in scripture. So we need to study together like this, be in the word, 
and uh, seek to be filled with the Spirit. In, in the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit is referred to, the, referred to as the Spirit of Truth more than any other way. And that's important because we need the Spirit of Truth to alert us to untruth. There's so much untruth and deception out there in the amen. forms of that. Pardon? I said, amen. Yeah. I mean, it can be as simple as some of the commercials. You're, you know, if you don't, if you use this deodorant, then you're going to really be a competent, you know, uh, person. Or if you, if you drink this or drive this, or if you have this portfolio, it can be in ways like that. But then for us spiritually, uh, it, these, these perversions, this untruth can come across equally as, you know, as, as common and be as prevalent. Uh, well, and I'm proud of Paul using the word of throwing you into confusion because we have to remember Galatia was a, a province. So it was an agricultural. So we have to take our minds out of the Rome and more uh, modernized and, you know, more knowledge thinking people. Uh, the people in Galatia were really wanting to embrace Christianity, but they were even being led astray. And I love that he, once again, with an eloquent tongue, said, throwing you into confusion. So it was a very gentle rebuke that, hey, be watchful of who is preaching to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true, Sean. And that's, that's good. That's good to remember the context there, too, uh, outside of, you know, the big urban center of, of Rome and to think of where they are uh, and in a sense how defenseless they are some of them are from false teachers like this uh, and this is exactly what paul on his last missionary journey headed to jerusalem stops and tells the ephesian elders when i leave there are going to be wolves who come in in sheepskin they're going to identify themselves as believers but they're going to be ferocious and merciless in, in stealing sheep and fleecing the flock and misleading them. And that's, this is exactly some of those wolves and sheepskin that uh, Paul talked about later. Um, so he goes into then giving a history and account of his own calling and a defense of his, of his ministry uh oh i meant to comment sean yes it's good to draw attention to throwing you into confusion because that's you know whether it's government or whether it's uh our spiritual enemy uh to destabilize people to make them fearful uh to confuse them you can always control people better uh when you you confuse people when you put out a smoke screen when there's when there's uh, accusations or untruth out there, people are always more easily controlled. And we need, of course, be aware of that ourselves in our own context, uh, just politically and spiritually, uh, but to understand, uh, understand that that's one of the tactics of the, of the enemy. So uh, you go on then to look at the accusations against Paul uh, 11, it's not something that I came up. It's not something I just got from Peter. He says that later at uh, 12, I didn't receive it from any man. I received it by revelation from Jesus. And it's, you know, we find out a little bit about the Paul's history. So we know it's in Acts. What is it? Acts nine, the first time that we, the, on the road to Damascus, when he's met by Jesus and, uh, and that's where I like to think of the, at least have the image in your mind of Psalm 23. Uh, surely, uh, because the, the normal NIV is not a good translation there in Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And it's stronger than that. It's not a matter of following us. It's pursuing us. Surely, God, you will pursue me all the days of my life. And that's a picture of what he did with Paul. Uh, because even in speaking to Paul, it, Paul counts that he gives, 
he mentioned, he talks about it three times in, in Acts, Acts 9, and then the other two chapters, I can't tell you uh, just right off by memory. Uh, but in one of them, he says, Jesus says, why do you keep kicking against the goats? Why do you keep resisting Paul? Because obviously he had been pursuing him. So after his road to Damascus experience, uh, you know, he'll tell us, that he goes into Arabia, but first it's interesting. Fourteen, uh, he, you know, thirteen. He tries to destroy the church. He's a persecutor of it. I was advancing in Judaism bond many Jews of my age, uh, and he'll say that in Philippians three. You know, he was a Pharisee. He may have been married. Uh, uh, church, the church history, church tradition thinks that he might have been married or. She possibly left him when he became a Christian. We don't know for sure, but that, that doesn't matter that much. Um, he just was very zealous. And in Philippians, he said, as far as being a Pharisee goes, man, I was a good one, flawless in terms of keeping the law. Uh, then he says, but when God called me, uh, I responded. 17, I didn't go to Jerusalem. I immediately went into Arabia there in verse 17 and later went to Damascus. Uh, so when we get him in Damascus, uh, you know, that's probably after he was delivered over, set out over the wall, went into Arabia and, uh, but was away for three years, verse 18. So for three years, we don't really have the, you know, no, uh, about Paul, except that there he was uh, in Arabia and other parts. He goes to Jerusalem, talks to Peter. He'll say, no, they didn't correct my gospel. They didn't change anything. Uh, later, he'll say, they only told me, don't forget the poor. And then we'll get into to chapter two. 14 years later, he goes to Jerusalem again. And uh, so it could be there's two different times he goes. Let's see real quickly. Uh, two visits to Jerusalem. Acts 9, Paul and Barnabas take benevolent help to Judea. Uh, Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem for the conference about circumcision and the law. Uh, so... Uh, not real clear exactly which one here. So if there's not anything there in chapter one, I don't think I overlooked any anything. We'll go on uh, to chapter two. Chapter two. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. 
the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Any initial response there? to anything that we read before we go through it. Um, I probably should know this, but um, the, the Galatians that he was that he was writing to had they had they not heard about Jesus yet? Is this a group that he wanted to go and minister to and uh, tell them about Jesus. And, they, and then he's, he's just fresh to them. You know, he, they don't, they're not really understanding too well. No, that's, that's a good and a fair question. Uh, so the ones that he's writing to probably, uh, you know, there's some discussion, is it the, the ones in the north part of modern day Turkey or the southern part? Uh, but most likely it was the ones that he had already been to uh, on his first missionary journey. Let me see. Uh, easy way, easiest way. Let me pull this up. Um, Paul's journeys. First, so, uh, so these are the churches that he went to. He and uh, he and Barnabas started out uh, from the church up here. So Antioch in Syria is so. There's one way over here in modern day Turkey, but Syria and Antioch is the one up here, like it, near modern day uh, Syria. And then they sail over to Cyprus, sail over to here. They go inland through these churches and establishes four churches, Antioch uh, in Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Persecuted, stoned, run out of some of those, comes back, and then, and then goes back. So those are the ones that he is writing to. So he had been there. Uh, he had preach Jesus to them and the good news that they had in Christ. And that's part of what we read earlier about some of the, the, the great effect on their society was that it erased some of those strong class barriers that, are, that were there in the Roman world at that time, slave and free. And uh, so they had heard of Jesus and it's interesting how there are people today and then who cannot rest uh, knowing that, you know, salvation is free by, by faith through grace, you know, that uh, they give themselves their time, their effort to go around and undo the work of somebody else, bring people back in slavery uh, to law, and so that's, that's what had happened. But in short, yes, they, they had heard 
of Jesus say unlike in Rome where in the book of Romans where he was wanting to go to Spain and preach in this case he had already been there and uh, helped establish these churches one other dumb question all my life I thought Galatia was a town a city but it is a an area is it a country Uh, then, it's certainly not now, then a region, uh, a part of, can we back up? Uh, so uh, here is all of Asia Minor. Uh, and today, so here's Syria, this would be modern day Turkey. Uh, so it was just a region within Turkey, see, like Galatia here, Cappadocia. Uh, so his first journey was further down south here. Galatia uh, is up here a little bit further. So not a country, but a under the Roman government. I don't know if it was a province, a region uh, made up of the Gauls. Uh, the G A U L S S, the Gaul people. Uh, and some of my references had it almost between Antioch and how do you say that? I Iconium. Iconium. It was like a, a very huge agricultural plateau. So it was really a lot more farmers than anything. Yeah. No, that's that's good. Uh, it looks like here it's making it look like it's all up north, but it encompassed even down here uh, further. And on the origin of them, I can't say for sure. That's a part of my world history, uh, uh, Carmen, that I am not positive about the Gauls. You know, are they, you know, the French, the... It changes, it changes. Yeah, it, changes. it does. So, but maybe, you know, that, that helps. This gives it... Uh, uh, with some of the modern day breakdown, you know, uh, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, and then countries over, over here, Greece. Um, so look at <clears throat> a few things. So verse uh, chapter two, 14 years later, he goes up with, with Barnabas. Uh, may have been when they took the uh, offering uh, for the, the Christians in, uh, uh, in Israel, uh, or at the time there in Judea and Jerusalem. Uh, but Paul, it, it's good that he could be that way. He, he wasn't one given to uh, bow down to titles. He says there in verse uh, 2, uh, I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run a race in vain. Uh, you know, saying, yes, they were, they were recognized as leaders, uh, uh, but he wasn't, though he wanted to uh, communicate with them, say, here's the gospel I've been preaching, uh, still not not bowing in the sense of later when Peter needs to be confronted, Paul is bold enough to do it. Uh, Titus not being, not forced to be circumcised. So uh, in your notes, deal with it some. So why, why did Paul, was he contradicting himself? He defends Titus from not needing to be circumcised. But later with Timothy uh, in the book of Acts, he will have Timothy circumcised. And uh, the notes do a good brief description of that and say, no, he's not contradicting himself because Titus, they were making it a test case that uh, Titus had to be circumcised in order to be accepted. And Paul saying, no, we're not going to give in to that. Uh, we will not circumcise Titus just so he'll be accepted by the Judaizers. With Timothy, there was no demand like that, but he said, Timothy, having a Jewish mother, a Greek father, he said, it will help Timothy in your ministry if you go ahead and are 
and are circumcised. So it's fine to be circumcised if it's not done out of a sense of obligation that it has that one has to in order to be saved. Uh, he talks about in verse four, in, they had infiltrated to spy out uh, the freedom that they had in Christ. Um, and you go on six again, well, verse five, sorry, five first, we did not give into them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. So we want to be committed to the good news of the gospel uh, and defend it. Again, he talks about in six, those who seem to be important, it doesn't make any difference to me. God doesn't judge my external appearance. Think of that all the way back to Samuel, uh, trying to choose a king, choosing the sons of Jesse based on their outer appearance. God says, you look at the outward appearance, I look at the heart. Um, and uh, in verse seven says, just as Peter was entrusted with the work of going to the Jews, I was uh, entrusted with the work of going to the Gentiles. Um, and then he says, verse nine, James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave us the right hand of fellowship. Ten, all they ask is that we remember the poor, the very thing we were eager to do. But then later, so when in Antioch, so if you go back to um, Uh, you can go back after their after their journey, uh, maybe even go after their journey, they came back through Antioch uh, on the first missionary journey. And Peter had been there for a while, had been eating with the Gentiles, but then when Judaizers came up, uh, Peter uh, bows to them, stops eating with the Gentiles. Paul calls him on the carpet. Because again, the gospel's at stake here uh, and confronts him. And so he's criticized for that because Peter, you know, is the rock of the church, a, a, a purported pillar. Uh, and so he confronts him and uh, some of the Judaizers, of course, use that against him. Uh, but you go on down then to what we know well there in six, uh, chapter two, verse 19, uh, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Um, and that's important there that 220, I think we have it. Um, uh, Paul standing up for the gospel, your notes will ask you the, the question uh, here, uh, where do we take a stand on? So there are disputable matters that we talked about in Romans 14 that are not a part of the core gospel and were to be uh, tolerant we show latitude to people on those but there are the core beliefs of the gospel like first corinthians 15 3 and 4 i delivered to you what was the first importance uh, that christ was crucified buried resurrected seen ascended and uh, we can't compromise on uh, the heart of the gospel the core of the gospel and uh, looking, uh, no, I thought maybe I had the verse uh, 220 uh, up here. Um, I have been crucified with Christ. So I don't know, in your own life, you may have reflected some uh, devotionally on Galatians 220. Uh, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Uh, I'd like to just pause and have any 
feedback or reflection from any of you that are willing to share uh, what you have thought about that scripture in the past. Uh, in a sense, you can say it's easier said than done, but uh, you know, what has it meant to you or uh, what does it mean practically for you in your life? Look at 220. I, I can reflect a little bit. Yeah, um, please go ahead, Jackie. Um, you know, the day-to-day -day, um, of walking in the faith and the gospel is, uh, it can be a little testy sometimes. But when you remember that you are, that I am, I to Christ. He died on my behalf. He gave up his life so that I could have a life eternal in heaven with the Father. It, it puts me back on track of what this whole life is all about. It's not about me. It's not about how I feel. It's about the principles that I have learned, you know, to love those who are unlovable, to forgive those who have done you wrong. It's not an easy job. But when you have people who walk in the faith with you too, it helps you and it makes your life a little bit easier knowing that somebody is walking. And that's probably how Paul felt. He, he wanted to, to know that there were other people who believed the same that he did, even though he wasn't gonna give up. He was gonna continue to live as you know, he, was, he was taught to live in Jesus. It's not easy but it's, it's doable. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. That's true. You're so right. When you say it's not, not easy, uh, but it is possible in Christ. I can't see their chooks. Did you unmute? Did you have something to share? Hmm. Okay. I, I don't think you did. Um, no, 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 I didn't. I didn't. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. All right. Um, anyone else? I appreciated that. Uh, uh, Jackie, it's good to be realistic about it, that uh, it is a challenge for us. We can it makes a good devotional song. We, we've sung this during all of our youth group days, even before going to Africa. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the faith, I live by faith in the Son of God who uh, loved me and died for me. Uh, all good for a song and devotional thought that when the rubber meets the road, uh, you know, how does it apply? How have I died with Christ? And uh, how is his life living in me? Uh, in our remaining few minutes, any, anyone else have a reflection or thought as well? Hello, Kirk, this is Diana. Yeah, Diana. You know, I have to... Um always every day it's not a problem for me to get up and thank god for just being able to be here and my story is who is it that i'm supposed to approach on this day and give me the words to say that will help them the way you've helped me um, i'm a cancer survivor and I'm thankful for that because my prayer when I found out I had cancer was that when they go in and do the surgery that they would find nothing and they found nothing. I still had to go through the procedures, um, but I always, you know, I'm thankful just for being able to wake up every day. He's allowed me to be here 68 years of my life and uh enjoy my grandkids and I, I often wonder how people can walk around every day and not give thanks to god 
for being here. You know, he gave his all. He gave Jesus so that we would be able to have life and have it more abundantly. And, and sometimes I, I don't have the words where I can, I feel like I'm thanking him enough for what he's done for me. You know, so it's very special that every day when I'm allowed to be here, I give him thanks and, and ask for continuous growth in my faith. Because now I can, if I am up against an issue that I'm not sure about, I just say, Lord, this one's on you, you know, and, and help me to come up with the right words and the right action so that it would be pleasing in his sight. You know, because we don't want, we don't want to cause anybody to go in the wrong direction with our actions. We're here to try and help them. So yeah. it, yeah, you know, it's, it's for me, my life is very special and I owe it all to God. And I thank him every day for it. Thank you, Diana. That's so good. Uh, that, that, Trade is priceless, I think, and so valuable in our lives of thanking the Lord every day for our lives. And then kind of the natural extension of that. So how would you use me today? You know, the Romans 12, how can I be a living sacrifice today? So that's yeah, so good, encouraging. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Uh, yes, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll keep it short, but I, I love this verse because it's kind of a, a reminder to me. It gives me great encouragement whenever, uh, especially when I am facing hard things or and and going through things. And I'm like, oh, Lord, here we go again. You know, how, how are we going to do this one together? And uh, it's a reminder for me that that the God that created the universe, <laughs> I mean, if you just look around it at just a few little things and then magnify that by millions and millions. The God that created the universe, he is residing in me and I am residing in him. And, and I know our human brains can't really wrap our mind fully around that concept, but it just gives me great encouragement because it's like, man, there is a, there's a power within me that is just beautiful and graceful and and so mighty and this little thing that I'm facing it it's nothing in comparison to what Christ had to face and I so I can I can do it I can do whatever it is that God asked me to do I can say the yes that he wants me to say I can face whatever circumstance he walks me through because I've got something so much greater on the inside of me and in turn I am inside of him through it all Hmm. Wow. Oh, so good. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. Um, and just that, that point about, uh, having him in you, uh, some have said, of course, in baptism, we, we, we enter into Christ through baptism and through the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, we take Christ into ourselves. And you talked about having Christ, his power in you. And, and, and we do through the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit who you have the spirit of Jesus in you, helping you. And I appreciate the perspective that, okay, this thing, and yes, it even may seem big to me, but this little thing that I'm dealing with, uh, I can do it through Christ. Mm -hmm. And if we really want to get radical, just think about this. We're not even seated here on earth, actually. <laughs> We're seated in, in a heavenly place. So uh, try to wrap your mind around that. <laughs> yeah. Seated with Christ in the heavenly places out of Ephesians. Yeah, it is true. And uh, those can seem all esoterical or just otherworldly, but but no, they they have real meaning for us if we can if if we will settle into it and and with the Lord think about it and uh, and and you know live into that claim that that He has given us through the Holy Spirit living in us uh, and it will help us. It's not going to erase everything that we face. It just helps us as we go through those things. 
Well, thank you all so much for sharing. That just always makes it uh, so much better than even just what I have to say alone. So thank you. We'll stop there uh, out of time and we will pick up next week, just two more weeks and uh, then we will be finished. So until next week, Lord bless you, keep you, and we will see you then. Thank, Thank you. you. God Thank bless you. you. Man, good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. Thank uh, you. Bye. God bless. God bless. Thank you. Good night.